Welcome to the One Away Show, presented by BW Missions. I am Brian Wish, and I am your host, and thanks so much for being here. On this show, I sit down with compelling entrepreneurs, authors, and rising leaders to talk through their most transformative relationships, experiences, and epiphanies. Curated with entrepreneurial leaders in mind, we'll dig into these finite moments in people's lives and understand how they helped set their path forward. Tony Mugavero is an experienced entrepreneur and executive with a background in media, business, and computer engineering. He is currently the founder and CEO of Rad, a consumer media app that delivers premium, immersive network experience on PlayStation, smart TVs, mobile devices, and content from Disney, Fox, Showtime, NBCU, and more. He's also the co-creator of Aura, a decentralized blockchain system for digital content. Tony co-founded Galvanize, one of the biggest co-working and education companies that was acquired by K-12 for $165 million in January 2020. Prior to building Galvanize, he was the founder and CEO of Move Atom, a simple API for providing cloud-based media encoding and delivery, which was successfully acquired in 2012. He was also the co-founder of the music discovery app Gigbeat, used by over a million users. Tony is one of those people who has an enormous heart, tremendous soft skills, tremendous coding and engineering ability, and really sees the future and what's coming. And uh, this is one of my more most enjoyable, uh, heartfelt uh, conversations about someone's career and early uh, upbringing. Tony, welcome to the One Away Show. Uh, awesome. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah, it's good Great. to be here and uh, connect for the second time. And, uh, you know, so I'm curious, Tony, given your background and everything you've done, you know, what, what's what's the one away moment that you want to share with us today? <laughs> um, that so this is it's so tricky because I think there's probably a few things that a few moments that have changed how I think about things and my trajectory in life. Um, You know, as I, as I've kind of thought about it a little bit, I mean, the, there was, there was a real moment that I think I was, I was working, I was, I was trying to go to school. uh, You know, I was DJing. I was uh, working at UPS loading trucks you know, I was 18 years old, 19. And, and so I had this kind of group of friends that we were all working at UPS together. We all went to University of North Texas for, you know, the first couple semesters. Uh, I actually lived with a couple of them in an apartment, uh, you know, we were just roommates as we were going to college. And you know, I had a girlfriend and it seemed like, it seemed like all the right things were, were in place. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, as I, as I noticed, uh, staying in that, in that group and staying in, you know, I was living in Louisville, Texas at the time, uh, going to university of North Texas in Denton, which is like, you know, North of there, I started to look at the people around me and, and started to think, you know, what are these people doing in my life? Are they, are they raising me up or are they bringing me down? Um, are we just going sideways? What, what are we doing here? And, and, you know, I, I wanted better for myself, but started to notice that there were, there, there were things around me that just felt natural because you evolve with your friends from high school and, you know, you have, you have the things that you like to do together and, and whatnot. And then you start partying and, <laughs> you know, um, and so it, it all kind of started to look like, even though it was fun and it was people that I was familiar with, it started to look like a toxic environment. Mm. And so uh, I, I had this moment and, and, you know, it just like woke me up. I feel like I, I was, I became a manager at UPS where I was like, 
you know, I was thinking like I could make, I could, UPS could be like a place where I, I could grow and like become, you know, more senior and make a lot more money and um, which nothing wrong with UPS, but also like, you know, I was, I was interested in computers and, you know, it's, there, there was something not lining up. I knew I wanted to grow, uh, but something wasn't lining up there. And then, you know, I was, as I was talking to my, my friends and my roommates, you know, I don't, I think we were kind of diverging on where we ultimately saw our lives going in the future. And um, which again, like people want to do what they want to do, but you want to be around people that are going to push you up. And so, you know, you're the, the average of the five people that you surround yourself with all the time. So uh, as I started to look at how all of these things were, you know, I was going to University of North Texas, just kind of, you know, trying to study like business computer information systems was the, was the, the, um, degree that I was starting to study there. And, and then I had this group of friends that I felt like, you know, really just wanted to party and like maybe less ambition around entrepreneurship and wanting to push things up. And then, you know, my, my girlfriend at the time wasn't super uh, ambitious, you know, just kind of living life and had had no real roadmap. And so all of those things, culminated into about the same time um, deciding that I was going to leave uh, UPS. I just went in and quit. <laughs> they were really upset about it. Um, and and because I, I like become a manager, I was like 19 years old, 20 years old, managing like 40 people. And, you know, a lot of them were just loading trucks and, and, you know, frankly, half of them were drug addicts and, you know, they were it was just like loading trucks in a warehouse kind of a thing. And, and then I started to look at like, okay, I need to, I need to get my school stuff on track. I was partying too much. I failed out of school. Um, and so I basically, uh, I, I was doing so poorly at, at UNT that I got kicked out of UNT. And they basically were like, go, go get your stuff together uh, at a community college or something, and you can come back when you get your grades up. And so basically that I took that as a signal as like, okay, th this is the wrong trajectory. Like I need to figure this out. So I, I put, I basically put that uh, into action. I went to a community college for a semester. And instead of going back to UNT, I went to SMU, which is you know, a smaller kind of private, more prestigious college that where I could study, you know, proper computer engineering. Um, and then, uh, you know, around that same time, my uh, basically broke up with my girlfriend. It wasn't, wasn't working. Um, and, and so, and then I, and then I like, I still continued to live with a couple of the roommates that I had when, when we started going to SMU, um, we got an apartment together and, and so, you know, closer to, closer to the school, but that my, my parents were like, what's happening? You, you just, you quit your job. Uh, you got kicked out of school. You lost your girlfriend. Like, and if you look at that all happening all at one time, it looks bad it looks like i'm going in the wrong direction right but in my mind i knew what i was doing you know right. i needed to get out of the environment of like you know i'm working in a warehouse uh and thinking that that's going to be my career path i'm i'm going to a school which is okay but i need to be like really getting after it and going so i, I paid for smu my, myself you know so i went to i went to a great school I, I hustled on the side. I mean, I, I waited tables and I was a teaching assistant at, at SMU. So I, I had like, and then I was DJing. So I had basically three jobs while I was going to SMU. Um, and then, you know, as I started to get towards the end of SMU, uh, you know, went to, went to New York and loved it. And, and so there was that one part of my life where you know, I said, what is the, 
what are, what are things that could be holding me back? Mm. And, you know, you start to look at, it's like the hard decisions, the hardest ones are like these people that I've known forever. They could be my friends. They could also be family. And, you know, looking at what your environment is and, and what could be holding you back and making decisions about who you have in your life. And, and so, you know, I, at that point decided that I needed to leave Dallas mm. <laughs> if I was going to really escape all of this. Can and, I? And so, yeah. Well, no. So I, I think this is great. I, and I think there are so, so many lessons in this story. And I think, and I, I'm so excited to get to where it all led. Right. And that's yeah, really yeah. exciting for, you know, any entrepreneur, any de- developer, any person in music, but so I want to know, so you, I want there's a few questions I have in all this, but one is, it sounds like there was this internal grappling inside of you where you just knew and you had to kind of move through a really messy situation. But before I kind of get to that question, my, the preceding question I think would be really interesting to me is good growing up, you know, in t- Texas, right? You grew up in mm-hmm. Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Dallas. Yeah. Dallas. Like, was your life pretty, you know, I'd say traditional in the sense of, you know, happy family, nothing crazy. I mean, not that any family is easy, but <laughs> what, like, what, what was your environment like growing up? Uh, mm-hmm. Because it sounds like, you know, you had to start being very intentional later, but did anything happen mm-hmm. growing up? Like, what was your kind of upbringing? And yeah. I'm just curious how this connects to maybe this situation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, it was super normal um, until I was like seven, seven or eight years old. That's when my, my parents got divorced, which, you know, like people can manage through all of that, but it, it's, it's also like creates a lot of like, you know, lack of understanding. It's at a kid that age and like, you know, just, don't know why things are happening the way they are and you see things as like they're not working out and then you're shuffling between you know parents and and you know they might get along but you're you're just constantly kind of dealing with that and then um you know that creates that creates like all kinds of you know miscommunications and and like points of points of failure essentially for um, you know, how to, how to grow and live your life and what, what's right and what's wrong, right? Um, oversight on, should you be doing certain things? Should you be hanging out with certain people? Um, you know, all of those things start to get shakier and or go away. And so um, it just it created a situation where, you know, I got lulled into uh, thinking that certain things were normal. Like I, I'm just like, these are the people that I'm around. And so like, this is my environment and it's normal. And like, I think that's a natural thing for everybody. You grow up in a town, you grow up with friends, you grow up with your family and that becomes your framework for normal. And it, it wasn't until I like really started to analyze that and say like, look, look around is, is this normal compared to what everybody else has? Are people doing things better? Can I be a better person? You know? And it even comes back to like, when your parents tell you like, you know, choose your friends wisely, or, you know, I don't think you should be hanging out with so-and-so that's running with the wrong crowd or whatever. Like those things matter (laughs) and putting, putting, putting yourself or as, as a parent, putting your kids in very intentional situations um, can, can completely change their trajectory. It can change their framework on how they view the world, how they should be spending their time. And so I missed that. I was missing that. Nobody was holding me accountable. You know, my friends weren't holding me accountable. And I, and I saw that as like going in the wrong direction. So, you know, I said, 
I have to start holding myself accountable. There's the, that's the only way that this is going to, there's that I'm going to be able to take full control over this. And so, like I said, it was like, fine, you know, I had food on the table and a roof over my head and, and I was going, I was going to college and working. So I mean, even though I was paying for it myself, um, but it, but it was like a very, you know, strong kind of moment of clarity really around the, the couple week period of like leaving UPS, breaking up with my girlfriend, <laughs> starting to separate myself from the toxic things in my life. And, and then I, you know, I think that really kind of put it into my head that like, I have to be very intentional about where I'm putting myself and who I'm surrounding myself with. And that, that ultimately um, has been a guiding principle for everything, entrepreneurship and creativity and how I think about my kids now, you know, like trying to be very intentional about it, not just letting the world happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one, one quick question being growing up in a similar, very parents divorcing around seven or eight, mm -hmm. do, do you think you're parents divorced like it finally set in maybe in that when you were a little bit older realizing you had to be more intentional like that didn't click right away you, like life was happening to you through childhood high school maybe a few years into college and all of a sudden it just kind of like walk well, this wave came over you and you're like okay now it's time I got to grab hold and be intentional about everything or I'm just curious because yeah yeah, totally. I mean, I, I think the, I, I was, I was learning kind of throughout that, you know, high school and early college that, um, you know, I was going to, I was, I was able to do things like work and get a paycheck and pay for my own things because nobody else was giving that to me. So, you know, I, I had a paper route when I was 11 years old so I could buy more video games because my parents weren't buying them for me and I wasn't making enough an allowance. And as soon as I got, you know, turned 16, I started working at Kroger bagging groceries. And, you know, I always kind of had that mentality of I, I need to work to, to be able to take care of myself. And so... You know, I think that that trajectory and and kind of my environment, there's two ways that can go. You either take care of yourself or you let it keep happening to you and wait for everybody else to take care of you. And so as I started to get into into, you know, broadening that kind of thinking out to every aspect of my life in, in terms of being intentional and you know, taking care, being able to take care of myself and then thinking about, you know, the environment and is it good for me, who I'm hanging around, you know, that kind of stuff that, that all, that's all started to come together kind of, you know, or, or yeah, around 2000, probably. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and just for reference, how, how old are you now? If you don't mind sharing. 43. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, right. yeah, I, I, more, I feel like so many more conversations offline, but I really appreciate the vulnerability uh, really beyond uh, measure. And like, I think it's profound that you were able to like, I think there's two ways you could have gone and you could have kept going down that path that you knew wasn't right just because it was comfortable and that's what you knew. Um, you, you kind of put in the key and broke away from the chains uh, that yeah. were pretty tight roped to your legs at the time. So let's let's talk about that. You you felt that internal feeling, and we'll get to your your kind of career and all the things. And um, but you you broke away from UPS, and you said I need to transfer to a school that's going to give me a chance to explore my interests a little more with focus capacity. What what was um? So you went to SMU and you you started to study and really get involved in computers. Take take us take me to take me in the audience down that rabbit hole where you started to really get connected and start maybe find yourself in in 
think about your next yeah. step. Yeah, I mean, I, I always enjoyed playing around with computers. I mean, my uh, my parents introduced computers uh, to me pretty early on. I mean, they we had like you know Atari and Nintendo, and then we had an actual computer. And I and I like my dad showed me how to write like little basic like DOS, you know, basic programs on on a windows machine um to just like make sound from the computer or you know like have it do basic math things like that and i thought that was fascinating and and so you know as i started to as in co in high school i was i was taking any elective you know i took in sixth grade the elective was like Commodore 64, like programming a Commodore 64. And we made a rocket ship take off and on the graphics of a Commodore 64. You can imagine that's like so old school, the green and, you know, black screens or whatever. Um, and then, you know, it throughout high school, all my electives, I took computer uh, programming and, and, uh, and so I knew I wanted to do something with computers. And when I went to UNT, it was business computer information systems. So it was like a hybrid of, you know, we were taking like economics, the half, half of it was like business courses and, and then half of it was computer courses, but it wasn't going deep enough into the computer side of things. I, I feel like, so as I, as I thought, like, you know, what can I do that's more technical SMU was the only proper computer engineering program in Texas at the time, where it was like, you know, not computer science, computer science is like a lot of programming and like a lot of theory, computer engineering is more has a hardware component to it. So we were like actually building circuits and like physical kind of crude, but physical circuits and, um, you know, uh, emulating Pentium chips in software you know, things like that. It, it got really deep uh, on the hardware side and, and the engineering side of things. I mean, we, we were getting into, uh, you know, chemistry and, and, and circuits, electricity, like how, how resistance works and how you flip logic gates and things like that. So that was all really interesting to me I'm going a little bit deeper. And so as, as I started to realize that understanding things from like the very base level of a computer all the way up to like how that manifests uh, to the real world and how humans interact with computers. That chain was always really interesting to me. So that's, yeah. that's kind of why I gravitated towards that. Love that. And it's so neat how your dad, that, that one little um, kind of helping you as a kid, mm -hmm. uh, write code. I was listening to, uh, Obama and Bruce Springsteen and talking about masculinity and Obama's dad gave him a basketball. So he explored basketball. It's so interesting how these little messages we get as kids, right? Uh, come into yeah. our life. So the, let's, exactly. let's, let's keep going. So I, I um, what, when was it when, you know, you built this foundational knowledge around computers and you saw it from the ground up, you saw humans interacted with computers when was it like that moment like you just knew like i had to keep exploring and and then how did you take that kind of spark if that's what you would define it as and then start applying that in kind of the early parts of your career getting involved in opportunities on campus out of campus uh to really kind of pour this knowledge into the continued learning like what what was next mm -hmm. yeah i mean when i when i transferred from unt and when it started going to SMU, I immediately felt like I was playing in a different league. And so it just felt more serious. And, um, you know, it felt like immediately I was surrounding myself with people who um, had a different trajectory. And so I felt like I should be doing something. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, we, we being me and, and my two roommates, you know, I, I wanted to start a record label. Um, we had a little music studio, you know, I wanted us to have a website, 
Um, you know, we were like doing design for artists and, and like local artists and helping produce their albums. And, you know, so I, I started, started going to this mode of, okay, well, how do I, how do I apply what I'm learning in school to like, starting to play around with web tech and, and, um, you know, start to actually like get some things out into the world that people can, can play around with. And, you know, like it wasn't hard tech at that point. I mean, I was still going to school and the web was still trying to figure itself out. I mean, it was like the beginning of web 2.0 in 1999, you know, like that's, so it was still pretty early days. Websites were still crude and, and it was still slow and clunky. And so, you know, that, that was a, a kind of a, a pressure that I started to feel just changing schools and being surrounded by that. It felt like I should be trying to do something and push. And so my, my mind naturally went to like entrepreneurship and I was doing things creatively with music, electronic music, by the way. So I was like fascinated with synthesizers and we were using purely, you know, computer-based music creation. So, you know, very early in that wave of electronic music and pure, you know, in the box kind of creation of music in the computer. And then putting that up on websites and using Flash to do crazy animations and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, that that's kind of, where I, I, I actually started my first real company. I went and registered, a, a you know, sole proprietorship just so I could get the, the, the organization formed. And then it turned into a couple of people wanted to get involved. And so we turned it into a, an LLC, but yeah, I mean, that, that was, you know, kind of late nineties, I, I went and started my first real company with my name on it. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I mean, I'm just thinking back to where you were and kind of this vast ocean of the internet and how exciting that must have been of kind of where you find your, your niche within and, and connect your, your passion uh, to it. And I also like really resonate with what you said about being in a different league uh, with the transfers. Like there was an, this elevated way that you like, wow, you know, and, and the, probably the people you're around, the motivation levels and just saying, I can make something of myself too. And so it must have been a, what I sense maybe is a very empowering, self-empowering experience. Mm -hmm. sort of focusing in and honing in on what you believed in and cared about. So, yeah. Um, with your so entrepreneurship, you know, your first company, I mean, I would, you've had, I think, a pretty, a very interesting career with all the kind of elements of, of where you've been doing. I mean, where, you know, at those beginning point, though, that first tipping point of saying, I'm going to start the business, or I'm going to really do it, where, where, where did you feel the most challenged at the time, technically, and were you able to really see maybe a vision forward for what was ahead of you, how the company was going to go, how you were going to integrate yourself into this vast ocean. I mean, where, where were your thoughts at the time and how did, how did that yeah. company evolve and expand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, starting, starting a record label and not really kind of being the tech being the foundation of it was, you know, it, it was a, it was a good kind of first, experience you know we did some contracts to release some records on different record labels and doing deals internationally um you know so there was some good learnings there but uh i you know when i graduated from college in 2003 we uh that's that's about the time where i started thinking i needed to live in new york and i had i i got a job like straight out of college and, um, and it was like working for a satellite tracking company for the transportation industry and, uh, which not really related to media. It was definitely tech, but, um, and then, and then had a, had like a year, a little over a year there. Um, and, and that's when I started looking around for jobs in New York. Uh, and I found one that was for video streaming and, and writing 
video live streaming video transcoders in in like 2005 2006 so you know the internet was just barely able to handle video streaming at that point <laughs> and uh things were still very expensive but i was working for other companies and i kind of always had this you know streak in me that i i knew i wanted to do something for myself and i but i knew that working for another company would give me good experience and whatnot so as i was working for this the streaming company in new york and i had moved there um again i started to look at like i was djing at night and then going into work exhausted you know the next day i'd dj until four o'clock in the morning and then have to be at work at like eight or nine and so you know i started to think like all right how am i going to merge these worlds and get get some focus and and some clarity here and and so you know that's when i started to think okay i need to start a start a new company that is tech centric um that uses my skill sets around actual engineering media technology um and so that was the first real i started a c corp there um called move atom m-o-o-v-a-t-o-m and uh basically had uh it was like a developer api really kind of developer centric mm -hmm. and it, that was in like 2008 is when i started thinking about it and then 2009 uh, but I built the whole thing as a single founder. And, and so, you know, that's a tough place to be <laughs> as a single founder, trying to build the whole thing, trying to get customers. And, and so that was the moment that I was like, okay, this, this is a C corp. This is technology centric. It's a real startup. I'm going to look at potentially raising some capital and getting some customers. That was more of the moment of like oh wow this is this is a whole different ball game like i just got slapped in the face with like what real startup life is about <laughs> you know like building everything getting customers talking about raising money you know all of those things marketing all of those things kind of came crashing down as like a harsh reality check <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, I mean, it must have been a very defining and learning experience. I mean, I, I relate to that in a lot of ways, which is our current position. And uh, I, I mean, did you know what to do? I mean, did, was it, you know, you, you were finally able to go out and combine? I mean, it was something I picked up on everything you're saying, and it seems to be a very clear pattern is this intuitive sense that you have for sixth sense that comes over you and you're I should, I should probably think about this or move here, or leave this relationship or combine my interests. Like that's really mm -hmm. I think, intentional. And so when you realize, hey, I need to really figure out how to merge marketing and raise money, yeah. customers. I mean, how did you navigate that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I went to school for kind of pure engineering and, and so, you know, there's a lot of business aspects that I don't think I fully understood. Um, and so trying to learn those kind of on the go, um, on the, like hit the ground running, that was, that was a real challenge because, you know, there was no book learning that I did. It was really just like, I have to engineer this stuff, but then I also have to learn how to sell and learn how to market and, you know, learn how to raise capital and correspond via email. And so all of those things were new to me. And I, I said, well, the best way to learn them is to just start doing them and try to learn along the way, you know, try, try to read as much as I can, learn as much as I can. And, and yeah, so I think that all, um, was was really kind of like a hard knocks lesson you know it was just get out there and start doing it and and learn along the way it's you know being self-taught to some degree but also like trying to just consume books and and 
you know, listen to, I would go to events and listen to people and talk how they talked about doing some of these things. And so, um, and then putting them into action, there's, there's no better way to like come up with a guest, put it into action, learn from it and iterate on it. You know, that's, you can read all you want in a, in a book, but there's no, the market's constantly changing and books, books get written after the fact, you know, like books get written by people who lived in that moment and learned from that moment. And then they write a book about it. <laughs> so the, the next things are always coming. And I feel like uh, having a combination of those things, learning about just kind of like classic problem solving in the sense of either, you know, business or computers, but also just constantly kind of being on the ground and trying to learn, live and learn. <laughs> totally. Yeah. It's uh, I, love, I love what you said. I wrote books get written after the fact. And I think that's so simple yet so profound. And so you, you built your playbook, you know, an application for all the future uh, things that I think that you've been involved with and in endeavors. Uh, Tony, um, I, I really want to ask you about, um, you know, feel free, we can go into other entrepreneurial endeavors, but the one that you're working on right now, you know, rad, rad, mm -hmm. rad. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would love to maybe you to share, you know, what you're doing, how the company started and pivoted to get to where it mm -hmm. is today and, and what you guys stand for and believe yeah. like, so closely tied to who you are. Totally. Yeah. 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 I mean, we started out as a, as a VR company um i mean actually we we really were kind of kicking some ideas around initially about like aggregating social media content and and so we did a couple more agency type deals where we were aggregating a bunch of social media posts into one place and mm -hmm. you know everybody wanted something different it didn't seem scalable and and, uh, and so we started to shift our focus into immersive and VR because we thought that there was going to be, you know, real challenge there and like hard technical problems to solve. And so we started building up this platform for immersive content and uh, called Little Star. <laughs> and, and so immediately kind of got a bunch of big, big studios and broadcasters onboarded and um, had some really good early partners and good hardware partnerships with Sony and Google on Daydream. And, you know, it was the rise of VR, kind of the modern VR era. And so a lot of resources flowing into the space, a lot of people excited about it. And, you know, just like everything, the market shifts and changes, you know, consumer behavior is going to be what it is and it's hard to change so people putting vr headsets on every day for hours at a time just isn't a thing it's still not a thing and so we had to look at that and say like okay there's some exciting potential here uh you know it's basically taking a really challenging kind of black box of content distribution and, and, and making it easy for the content creators and the hardware companies to kind of marry all of these things together and get these, get, get experiences in front of consumers. So the, we started to look at that abstract and say, okay, well, what are we good at? We're good at technology and hard distribution problems. And we're a trusted partner with content companies and hardware companies. And we have a direct consumer relationship. So how can we leverage all of those things, given that the VR landscape is changing and, and, you know, taking its time, it's going to continue to take its time. It's clear. Um, so that's when we started to look at, you know, what can we do to make ourselves, you know, reinvent ourselves and so we started playing around with blockchain technology in like 2017, 2018. We broadened our scope to start to support other forms of content like traditional video content. <clears throat> um, 
you know, we introduced live streaming and, and watch parties and, um, you know, various things over the last, last couple of years, really, but there wasn't a good answer to the question, why us, you know, in the VR space, there was a good answer to why us, we were initially the only place that you could actually do some of these things. I mean, we could stream 360, 360 video across devices before it was like an OTT VR play. Like we were the only company that could do it for a while. So, you know, over time, as that kind of fell away or the VR industry went sideways a little bit, we started to say, well, how can, what's our answer to why us? And so as we introduced a bunch of these new features and we, uh, you know, we went through a refresh on the, on the rebrand. Um, so we basically just changed the app name from little star to rad, um, which comes from like radiance. So we were thinking like, what, what can we, how can we anchor this to stars? <laughs> um, yeah. So, so essentially, uh, you know, we, we updated the brand, we started to incorporate new content types and, um, and then really as like the modern kind of evolution of blockchain and NFTs started to come to the forefront um, and, and gain excitement again, we said, okay, look, we, we can do immersive, we've done blockchain, we can do traditional video. There's a lot of companies that are now coming to us and saying, how do we do this? How can we get into the blockchain space as a content company? Mm -hmm. And so we've kind of like really recently in like the last few months found ourselves um, at kind of that same intersection of trust again, where you know, we know how to build hard technology. We know how to distribute content. We know how to work with hardware partners and content partners and get things out to consumers. And so all of those things have culminated into, uh, you know, us kind of refreshing the blockchain work that we did and bringing essentially um, the ability to package up content as NFTs for movies, TV, celebrities mm. um so you know we still have a streaming platform it's on the playstation and google tv and mobile devices and the web etc um and we haven't we're not changing that distribution model it's really just how it's packaged up and sold um and blockchain i think creates an interesting opportunity around scarcity and collectibles and you know, verifying that somebody actually owns the content. Uh, you know, consumers don't really care about blockchain, the technology. They just want to know that they're getting something cool. Um, they're getting something that nobody else has. Um, they're getting a more efficient economic model. Uh, they're getting exclusive content. Like that's really all the consumer cares about. So, you know, we're, it's a good, strong foundation in technology, and that's how we work with the content and the hardware companies. But from a consumer perspective, it's really trying to package those things up in a clean, simple, like cool, vibey, you know, like right. the content has a voice. You know, the, the, the first things we're doing are with like Cowboy, uh, who just did a song with Lil Wayne. Um, Nightmare, who's one of the biggest EDM artists, um, Elliot Sloan, who is like a five times X Games gold medalist in skateboarding. Um, yeah, there's a couple other ones that are that are coming as well. But you know, it's that's all that's like hip hop, EDM, skateboarding. You know, we're working on like some esports stuff and cannabis culture, and so it all kind of is coming back into uh you know a sense of clarity around and a sense of purpose where the original sense of purpose was we we found ourselves as like a trusted party between hardware companies content companies and consumers that we're doing something different from a content perspective we're doing something different from a from a technology perspective and then we're, we're packaging that up into a kind of simple and easily accessible interface. So that for consumers. So that abstract 
holds true today. And that's kind of been our core DNA that I think, um, you know, we, we provide a lot of value at that intersection of trust. Wow. It's uh, one, I think timing wise, you know, you guys are at a nice precipice on the wave, so to speak, mm -hmm. given the foundational elements you've built and where kind of the, the things are going, which I'm sure is very exciting for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in a lot of ways uh, but I think like let's if we tie this back to like where you are now and I know we skipped over a lot of the messy middle um, mm -hmm. but if we tie like today's moment back to when you were I think 18 or 19 years old mm -hmm. and you know the, the thread in this is like making those you know harder decisions it sounds like trusting that intuition and uh just saying, understanding what you needed to do for you uh, to get to where you want to go and be very intentional in the process along the way, which you've followed this curiosity for the last, you know, 20 plus years. And mm -hmm. it could be, it sounds like the, the forefront of something really special uh, in a way that most people just resources, time, infrastructure or not. And yeah. uh, it must be really rewarding for you to kind of look back and be like, this isn't just luck. This has been a very intentional process where luck and persistence and hard work kind of are coming together. Mm -hmm. that, do, you, do you feel or sense that? Yeah, I mean, it's really about like thinking about where, you know, skating to where the puck's going, right? Basically, you know, thinking about what what is coming and how you know different parts of the world fit together for people and what their behavior is doing and and you know trying to trying to essentially think about like okay well if, I, if i'm going to be there when the time comes then how do i position things now and so you know there's always kind of this kind of forward rolling like you know i don't like to spend too much time in the future just thinking about the future because now the moment is now <laughs> and really kind of all that matters but also thinking about those things as uh i think natural and and if you're a builder if you're a creator and you see where things are going or where you want them to go then there's no better way to to get there than to like build it and position yourself to be there and and when it when the time comes so so yeah it's it's a it's a little bit of a game of chess not checkers and uh you know think a hundred moves ahead and <laughs> yeah, exactly. see which one plays out and how you win so yeah you know that's at least that's how my mental model has developed and but i i still do try to live as much in the now as possible <laughs> <laughs> yeah right and so the, the the entrepreneurial challenge of living in the present trying to see like you said 100 moves ahead and understand where to put put time and uh well well said tony uh i want to ask one more question and then we'll wrap up and uh but I, this interview has been so raw and candid and mm -hmm. need to see the trajectory and points of connection so thank you yeah, uh, you know, when, when you look back and and kind of just say 30, 40 years out from now, from where you are today, where where do you see, like, if you were to define legacy or define like meaning and say, this is what I, this is the life I'd wanted to live or what I would want people to say about me, um, maybe in all realms of your life, what 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 does that look like to you? Yeah, I mean... I think one of the things that I kind of realized in the, in the journey and like my change over in kind of that moment really, and, and, you know, changing schools and changing career trajectory and all of that is that, you know, the, you're not a, you're not a victim of circumstance in the world. It's, it's like you are putting yourself in, positions and you can view the world in 
two ways. You can either be negative about it or you can be positive about it. And I chose to be positive about everything and, um, you know, try to lift people up. And, and also all the people around me, I feel like there's a duty to the people around me that um, I'm a good person in their circle. <laughs> and, you know, I'm always trying to learn and be better so that as I'm, you know, around other people and giving input into their lives, I'm trying to do that in a positive way and trying to, to lift and elevate. And, and so, you know, people kind of, even to some degree, like get frustrated with me because I'm constantly cheerleading. And, and even in, even in really tough situations, trying to say like, you know, it's okay, it's happened, here's what we need to do to get through it and we're gonna get through it. And so people's natural reaction is to like get negative and people love to commiserate and, and complain. Complaining is very easy. You go into a complaining spiral, especially if you're doing it with somebody else or two or three people and you all are complaining. Um, and that just ends up being super negative. So you know, and generally like in, in technology or in relationships or in business, you know, whatever it is, I'm trying to spend all of my energy pushing things up, you know, like why would you ever spend any energy being negative or trying to tear things down or trying to, to, you know, intentionally discount things or even discount things like that you don't you don't even know that you're doing it but just like undermine things or always look at the worst case scenarios that can happen you know there are people that just live their whole lives looking at the worst case scenario looking they they plan their lives around the exceptions like the things that are remotely never going to happen um you know planning your whole life around that just puts you in a cage mm. and so you know like in in every aspect of my life I've tried to position how I'm learning and what I'm doing and what I'm putting into the world to the people around me that I'm trying to lift them up so you know in 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 40 years or whatever in 50 years like that's how that's what I feel like I want I want to people to know that I put into the world you know like the last thing you want to have is when you're when you're when your funeral that nobody shows up and they're like, that guy's a, that guy was a dick. <laughs> love it. So uh, my, so I love so many parts of this conversation. I'm actually wearing a shirt. It says powered by optimism. Nice. Nice. So, strong. Um, uh, you must've been, must've been knowing this call was going to happen. <laughs> uh, Tony, yeah. last question. Where, thank you. Where, where can people find you if they wanted to connect or ask you a follow-up question? Yeah, so on on Twitter, uh, I'm he's so Tony H E S S O T O N Y. Um, also on Instagram, I don't spend really any. I mean, I have. I thought I deleted my Facebook, but I don't. I don't have it anymore. Um, it's. I think it's still there, but I'm never on there. Uh, and um, LinkedIn, you know, uh, my full my full name is John Anthony Mugavero, but yeah, everybody calls me Tony, so. Um, I have, you know, lots of, lots of connections on LinkedIn. And so if you want to connect with me there, then you can see who I know and who I can connect you with potentially, or how I can be helpful, um, from a business perspective. And, um, yeah, so those are, those are kind of the big things on social. I mean, I'm just Tony at rad.live, um, you know, my email, if, if anybody wants to talk about doing content deals or, or technology, but. Um, yeah, I always, I always like to be helpful. I mean, I was a teaching assistant and, uh, you know, I've been a, a mentor at Techstars, you know, for a, a year and, you know, I've done, done a handful of those things. And, and so I always like to try to be helpful where I can, but, um, yeah, so those are probably the, the primary ways to get in touch with me. Amazing. Well, I appreciate you showing up today and appreciate this conversation and thank you uh, for having so me. Yeah.
If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, I hope you leave a review on the platform of your choice and share it with a friend who you think would find it valuable. If you'd like to receive our written newsletter and thought leadership, head on over to bwmissions.com backslash newsletter and subscribe. See you on the next show.